If you have a Bible with you, if you'd open it up to Matthew chapter two, pull it up on a device or an iPhone, or you can just listen as I read it, which is perfectly fine with me. Matthew chapter two, verses one through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly, found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report back to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed and on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Think of the longest road trip you've ever taken. I can call to mind there's two. They were the same route, interestingly enough, separated by about 25 years. One was a trip to, from Oklahoma City to Los Angeles, riding with my dad as he was on his way there. The other one was with my brother-in-law, traveling from Oklahoma City to Los Angeles as he headed off to grad school. The trip with dad was in a, a pretty comfortable sedan and a very enjoyable trip. And the trip with my brother-in-law was in his uh, Jeep Wrangler, with the canvas top and canvas doors. And uh, we were towing a trailer, I kid you not, that is larger than the Jeep. And so uh, here we go, uh, heading toward California through the desert, hotter than blazes, and at one point we used beach towels to wrap our sides because that's where the sun was hitting us on both sides of the Jeep, and cold towels over our heads. Back then, nobody gave it a thought. Today, we would have been pulled over numerous times under suspicion of all kinds of things. But anyway, we had a great time. It was a long trip, and I checked the mileage, 1,356 miles to be exact. We drove it straight through. The wise men take a trip. Maybe you've not ever heard how long that trip was. It was 1,600 miles. Walking or riding on an animal, one, one, neither of which were very fast. The journey would have taken them at least a couple of months each way. The story of the wise men has usually been understood as three wise men, three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's a great story, great songs. We three kings of Orionar, uh, we, we sing those songs, and that's all good. Chances are pretty good, though, there were more than three. It was probably a large caravan of people and animals, particularly with the valuables that they were bringing, just by chance, just in case. Hope beyond all hope that what they were seeing in the sky truly was the arrival of God on the planet. So they're traveling 1,600 miles. Now it's interesting because scholar is the word by Eugene Peterson given to the wise men, the magi, they're called those things. But basically, they were some of the wisest people, highly respected for their wisdom in that day. They studied things, particularly the nighttime skies. They were familiar with prophetic statements in the Bible talking about the star, that a, that a ruler would rise from Israel. So they're wondering, could this be what we're seeing? Could this, they'd never seen anything like it before. They saw this unusual conjunction of planets that occurred around the time Jesus was born. Get this, even today, scholars will tell you there is in fact a moment in history around the time Jesus was born. It's proven, you can go look at the records if you really have to go see them, but they know by, in fact, there was this alignment of Jupiter and Saturn three different times around the time Jesus was born. 
And history records this event. So they walk 1,600 miles to study it, to watch it, to follow it. And the real question is, why? Why? Why'd they do that? No one sent them. These are wise people. They were intellectuals. They are not given to superstitious stuff. But in order to be sure, they gathered the extravagant treasures to present just in case this was in fact what they were hoping it was. A couple of observations this year for me out of this text that I really hadn't given much thought to, one in particular. First of all, though, the real story coming out of this text is the story of hope. We, we can't really relate to waiting over long periods of time. We can't relate to someone 100 years ago or 200 years ago in our life history uh, waiting for something that was passed on to us to wait for it, that's passed on to someone else to wait for it. That, we just can't get that. But they knew this kind of life very well. And they'd been hoping beyond all hope to be alive when that day came. And so now they're seeing this unusual thing in the sky and they're, they're wondering, is this it? They're hopeful. And it was this hope that drove a 1,600 mile walk, basically. Hope by definition, it's real simple. It's favorable and confident expectation. Favorable and confident expectation. In other words, hope is not wishful thinking. And they would not stop until they could see with their eyes the meaning of the skies. They didn't stop walking until they found him. And when they found Jesus, they were filled with hope. And the first thing they do is worship him. And the event in the sky did turn out to be the announcement they'd been waiting for for generations. A second observation is the gifts, the obvious things. We always talk about the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's so much meaning, though, that they, the, the meaning that they meant the minute they were, they were giving them to Mary and Joseph and the meaning they would have some 30 years later. Gold, for example, is a gift of royalty. It signifies royalty or a, a kingship. Clearly, this gold was going to help this couple survive financially. They were known to not have that much. But gold is a regal gift for a king. Frankincense. It, it's the gift of recognizing a priestly role. Why? Because this is exactly what they would use to fill the temple. The aroma of the temple was frankincense. So when, this was exactly what it was. And so when you would smell that, you knew, or it would take you back had you been there, to the temple. It would remind you of what that smelled like. And the priests would come to mind. The gold is royalty for a king. The frankincense is a gift of priestly of a priestly role for Jesus. The myrrh, somewhat unique gift, and we don't want to take too much liberty here, but there were really two purposes for myrrh. One was perfume. They would use that on clothing to help it smell better. They would use that, obviously, as perfume. But there was one other use, and you see a lot of examples of that throughout the scriptures. Myrrh was used to prepare a dead body for burial. Myrrh was used by Nicodemus and Joseph to prepare Jesus' body for burial. You can read that on in the Gospels. So just for a moment, you have to wonder which way did Mary take this? Did she sit back and think that's really expensive perfume? Or, and maybe and, also realize that it's also used predominantly to prepare a body for burial. What's that mean? And, and, and think of this for a minute. It'd be like going to a baby shower with a gift certificate toward funeral expenses. Bizarre, isn't it? Was I too soon, she thought? Was I, when is this going to be available? When am I supposed to use it? When would I ever need this? Was I anticipating this? 
But these gifts would later become unique symbols. It's so interesting what they became some 30 years later in the, in the last few days of, of the life of Jesus Christ. The gold would tell the story of the confrontation with the king, Pontius Pilate. You know the great story. We usually hear about Easter when they, the, the, the king could uh, release a prisoner of the, of the crowd's choosing. And so it was, give me, I can release Barabbas or I can release Jesus. Who do you want? And the crowd yells, you know the story, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. So the gold takes us to that story when the king would offer that opportunity to the crowd. And then you've got the frankincense, the confrontation with Caiaphas, the high priest. See how important these gifts were probably in ways that the wise men would ever have imagined. The confrontation with death itself would cause the need for myrrh. So this is a story of hope. This is a story of unique and prophetic gifts, if you want to call it that. And there's a third observation, though, that really had not occurred to me in many years reading through these texts as I prepare for Christmas. A third observation. The wise men traveled 1,600 miles. The religious leaders in Jerusalem would not travel 10 miles. You can look it up on MapQuest. Jerusalem is 9.7 miles from Bethlehem. It's about the same distance as, you, as walking around Lake Hefner. A over nine miles. There's no indication that any of the religious leadership in Jerusalem took the time to walk 9.7 miles to see for themselves what was going on. They said to the wise men, go ahead, go, go have a look, and when you find out, come back and let us know what you find. My dad attended... Uh, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church on Laguna Beach for 30 years, uh, most of his 30 years in California until his passing. And in the last uh, few years of, of his life there, a great pastor there at, the, at uh, St. Andrew's. And, and he made a comment that I've heard him say, and I was stunned that he said it. And this pastor, Dr. Richard Conwister, he's a, he's a brilliant man, a PhD and MDiv and all those things. He's very, very wise. He said this once, some of the most jaded people I know work in churches. Some of the most skeptical teachers I know teach in seminaries. You can be, here, here it comes folks, this is what grabbed me. You can be really close to the scriptures you can be really close to the promises of God and you can be this close to Bethlehem and you can miss it even though other people are traveling a long, long way to see it and experience it. And it caused me to ask myself a question and it caused me to want to pose a question to you. How far are you willing to go to pursue the story of Jesus? Because I find a lot of people these days who just heard a friend say, here's what I think about Jesus. It's really no big deal. It's really some grand fairy tale that's been overblown by Christians and people will buy it. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I, I long for people who will have the integrity to travel as far as it takes intellectually or, or mentally or spiritually. I long for people that will say, I'm going to take this journey until I know what I believe. I, I'm going to follow this star of sorts to find out what I believe and what I think, not what someone else has told me to think or someone else's opinion has led me to think. And this really got to me this year. And I've got another thing kind of going. I've grown up in church, been in church all my life, frankly, which I'm very thankful for. I'm, I'm one of those preacher's kids that grew up in church and didn't leave when I had a chance to, you know? A lot of preacher's kids, we just, as soon as we graduate from high school, we're out of there and we're not going back. 
I'm so thankful for parents and church families that just helped me see God and loved us. I'll tell people frequently, I'm a preacher's kid and I've got the counseling bills to prove it. <laughs> but I know so many people who think they encounter Jesus, and let me just say it, it's gonna sound harsh and maybe a bit ugly, but I believe it with all my heart. I know a whole lot of people who've had, had an encounter with a really lousy Jesus follower who misrepresented Jesus in a gross way. And if I'd encountered those kinds of people in my life, I would have turned and run away too. The wise men traveled 1,600 miles. The religious elite wouldn't go 9.7 miles. I think we need to take note of that and find out which group would we be in you can be so familiar with the promises of God, they become meaningless. I've encountered people who've lost hope, wondering if there's any truth to this whole Jesus story. And I understand why they're doubting, to be honest with you. The message to them has been, you're bad, God's good, so just try harder. The message has been that God is just angry with us. You know what's interesting? Jesus was crucified by the religious elite of his day. You, you, we do realize this, don't we? The devout religious types of that day did not appreciate a man approaching a woman at a well who had a really bad reputation with men. The devoutly religious folks didn't think it was wise to allow a woman with a sketchy reputation to wet his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. The religious folks saw no reason a religious man, a true religious man, would have lunch with a dishonest businessman. The, the religious folks didn't go for the idea of a God that would really love everybody unconditionally before we would even know that he loved us. The religious folks were furious when some good church-going folks, when Jesus shows up to these good church-going people to postpone the stoning of a woman who'd been called in adultery. And Jesus said, hey, if you've not ever sinned, then go ahead and throw your rock. And of course, he's, they all dropped and walked away. And I've always wondered, where was the guy? Doesn't it take two? The religious folks. We're never going to make it easy to find Jesus. Sometimes people with close proximity to Jesus are the ones who often get in the way of those who are trying to find him. I know that to be true. You can take it from me. I see it all the time. Read the four gospels. Start Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the eyewitnesses. You might find him there. Are you willing to go that far? to find out what this is all about. How far would we travel to find him? How far would we go to follow him? How far will we go in tough times to find him even there in the darkest moments waiting for us, because he is? I'll never forget, it's been at least 25, maybe 30 years ago, and I wanted to go to Chicago to a church that's had a great influence in my life. They've, had a, they, they've been a great influencer of great churches and teaching us how to really reach people for Jesus. I, I owe a great deal of gratitude to that church. So one uh, Wednesday, I flew to Chicago, uh, and I, it was bitter cold. It was in January. I pull up at the church parking lot. It's jammed. You can't find a parking spot. It's 7.25 p.m. at this church. There was no dinner provided when you get there, and there was no child care available, and yet every seat was taken. 3,000 people were sitting there to have this worship service that I'd been hearing about and this great teaching from a man I still highly respect, John Ortberg. He's at Menlo Park Presbyterian. He's one of my favorites. I was blown away. It was so cold, I didn't want to get out of the car. And you know what happened on Thursday night? The exact same thing. They started having to do two nights because one wouldn't contain it. So now there were 6,000 people at 7.30 p.m. 
Wednesday night at 7.30 and Thursday night at 7.30, gathered to have a worship experience and hear some great teaching about the Bible that was life-changing. And one of those leading worship was a guy named Dieter Zander, who would later pastor and be quite a leader in church circles. I didn't know what had happened to him about 11 years ago. In his 40s, Dieter Zander woke up one morning having had a stroke. He went to bed fine. He woke up unable to talk or move. In his 40s, lost function in both hands, had to learn everything over again, managed to get one hand to work better, once led thousands with hands that could no longer play a piano or be raised to lead a worship service for 3,000 people on a Wednesday night in Chicago. His most recent job was sitting in a back room sorting fruit at a Trader Joe's in Southern California. He was taking the bad fruit off of the, out of the way of what would end up out in the grocery store. Take the bad fruit, the fruit that had been bruised or whatever, and with his one hand, he would pull the fruit that shouldn't be in, sold, he would pull it out and put it in another box. He would later write a book called A Stroke of Grace, and in it he says this. I want you to read it as I read it. It is good that I work here. I am like that fruit. I'm imperfect inside. I'm the same person, the same sense of humor, the same thoughts, but my words betray me. What should take three minutes to say is an hour of frustration. People lose patience with me. Aphasia means aloneness, but God hears me. My world is small and quiet, slow and simple. No stage, no performance, more real, all good. All good. And here's a man who found Jesus in a fresh way, in a place he would never have gone looking for him. In the middle of the worst nightmare of his life, he can say, all good. He's become one heck of a photographer. It's amazing what he has accomplished. When so many of us, me included, would have been angry and bitter and quit. How far would we be willing to go to really find Jesus? I'd like to be in the crowd that's willing to go 1,600 miles if that's what it takes. And I really don't want to be one of those that'll just give it 9.7 miles and call it good. Just in case you're wondering, God did not send Jesus because he was mad. He sent him because he loved us. And Jesus himself would say we were like sheep, helpless sheep without a shepherd. And that's a very correct definition of our condition. He knows me, he understands me, he's my hope. I long ago did not deserve anything from him, and yet he chooses to love anyway. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for both the simplicity, the complexity, the power of this Bible. So much we will never understand, but so much we can clearly understand. Father, thank you for loving us enough to send a symbol of that love in your son, Jesus Christ. There's parts of it sometimes, Father, that are hard for the, the most seasoned Christian to believe and embrace. But in faith, Father, we realize just the deep truth that we find there. That in the middle of life's circumstances, we find hope. We find someone who loves us, and we can then say life is all good, regardless of the circumstance. 
God, thank you for loving us this much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.